Right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, privilege. Privilege has always become privileges. We do not stop the industry street until we carry on talking to legends. That's what it's really about. And sitting right beside me, I'll be honest with you, because I know I said I've known him for years. I've known his name for years. And I really haven't actually... I met him once. I think I only met him once. Mm. Uh, he knows of me. I know of him. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting no more time, I'd like to present the one and only... Mr. Mr. Banton, greetings. Mr. Banton. The ragamuffin man. The ragga... Would you say you're the original of the old school ragamuffin? Definitely. But don't go far. Definitely. Because right now, ladies and gentlemen, i like to say to Mr. Banton, this is all about your life. Now, Mr. Banton, I do believe, was born in East London. Born and bred, to my belief, I might get it wrong, in Hackney. Am I right? Born but not bred. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> born but not bred. I was born in Hackney. Yes. But, um, as was typical of my generation, at age eight months, my mum took me to Jamaica, left me there, and nobody came back for me until I was ten. Oh, really? So, primary school and the early years, I grew up with my grandmother and my two brothers. In JA? In a place called Heart Hill, um, in Portland, next to St. Mary. Capleton country, but I also had my father's side of things, um, St. Anne's in uh, Mount Moriah. Not a lot of people know there, but if you know the sound bass odyssey, they come from Christiana and those, those ends. That's where I spent my school holidays um, with my father's side of the family. That's what you call a real country, one road right up the hill, everybody know everybody. Wow. Now, being in Jamaica with an upbringing and all stuff out, would you have said that you had it, times were hard? No. I have to say that I respect and rate my parents for doing that. Although it was quite prevalent in those times for that generation, because a lot of people I know, Jamaicans that I know, have that type of upbringing where parents send them back, they grew up with grandma and came to this country. That's the best thing my mom could have done for me because it grounded me. I don't think I would have enjoyed the success I've enjoyed in England had I not had that. So living in Jamaica with the sort of differences between the young up and bringing, being here, coming here after being 10 and seeing the differences, was it more of an easily life here or would you have said not really? Um, it's a combination. Where schooling was concerned, that was, that was an issue for me because the British schools were behind. So what they were trying to teach me when I got here, I already knew. So that caused some issues in terms of boredom. Um, I didn't like the school meals here. When you're getting mackerel and banana <laughs> in Jamaica <laughs> for lunch, um, what they're giving you, the chips and peas, don't, don't really make it. Um, in regards to opportunities, this country has more opportunities, obviously. And um, I come from a poor background. Mm. Um, obviously a lot of Jamaicans you know we're poor we're hustlers but the mentality that I came to this country with I, I learned from Jamaica that you can't sit down and expect anything you have to go out there you, you have to get it, it for yourself mm. yeah mm. so in that aspect I can't say it was um, more difficult but there were some issues I had there because those days um, op open your mouth to them British kids as soon as they hear the accent I was a real skinny maga kid, but the amount of fights I had was just ridiculous. I got beat but your up. your voice intimidating? Because they say Jamaican voice, so it seemed that very way. very intimidating. It seemed that way because a, a simple conversation like, hello, and as soon as I say hello back, they'll say, where you're from? And I say, Jamaica, I come from. And it's as if they felt intimidated, intimidated within 30 seconds. Most of the time I'd be in a fight. Don't want to challenge you. And then once that stopped, the other issue I had with fights was um, at that time there were African children that were, were in the, um, coming to the UK. And it wasn't fashionable to be African when I was growing up them times. So I had a lot of fights. Many times I got beat up defending African kids. <laughs> <laughs> One guy, Abdullah. They, every time he opened his mouth, they wanted to beat him. And I used to jump in the way. And, protect him. and I used to end up getting beat up for him. But um, it was one of them things. So it sounds it? like to me, you, wouldn't, you couldn't handle bullies. Um, it's strange you say that because I turned into one. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, let's be real. Turned right. into a bully. Uh, of course, you're the only. Ch are you the only child? No, nah, there's. I've got eight. There's eight. Eight in total. Wow. Four 
direct like three brothers and a sister who I grew up with my, me and my two brothers we grew up in Jamaica and came here mm. and when we came here my sister was here she never had the Jamaica side but outside of that my dad has had four children so I've got two other brothers two half brothers and two half sisters right so being brought up here in London and mm -hmm. and being with the other side of the family and stuff like that you, t you just said that you became a bully was that because you felt you were being bullied at home no there was no bullying at home home life was brilliant mm. the bullying side of it didn't come into me until i attended boarding school secondary and that's when i started to get into the bullying and it was a case of um, when i came here i had to do a year at primary school finish that i went to secondary school i went to hackney downs but within a, the first week I got cane. That was I, a war zone, man. I, I had some, a couple of fights, <laughs> few fights in there. And my mother recognised that perhaps, you know, having three Jamaican children wasn't the best thing. So she, what she did was she um, invested in us and sent all three of us to boarding school. Myself and my younger brother went to one When you say school. boarding school, was it for good boys or bad boys? Because no, no, it wasn't boarding school. school. It wasn't boarding school. school. It wasn't boarding school. It was, it was a boarding school. It okay. was somewhere where you paid for. Okay. The actual boarding school that I went to was a government experiment. Okay. It was, County Hall was a prevalent at the time. It was them putting a load of kids from different countries, from different backgrounds and different areas together to see. So I had kids from Scotland, Italy, France, Uganda, in, it was a proper international Intermix. setup, yeah, mm, of mix mm, there. Mm. So, um, but after the year in Acne Downs and getting into so much trouble, I got to boarding school and in my head I said, right, that's it. As soon as I get there, the biggest brother, I'm going to fight him. <laughs> Straight. The biggest man, I'm going to look for him and fight him to just done this whole heap of fight fight. So, um, I did that. Well, not directly seek him out, but as soon as I look at the argument who start, the big boy was. yeah, we find the reputation. A guy called Wilf, and I, I, the, the, the night we got into an argument, I said to him, "Yeah, I'm ready for you." So um, he said, "All right, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll do we'll do the thing." So I said, "All right," but couldn't sleep the night. Couldn't sleep, so I wake up first thing in the morning, and we used to share coming out showers and yeah, yeah. The, the, the the wash basin and that. So I fly to him bed, I'm morning for finding him, and he wasn't there. So I said, oh. "What?" So I went straight to the washroom, and it, it Wolf was there trying to brush his teeth, and I was right, come, come, come up right now, ready. <laughs> and he was just shocked, and he never wanted it. He said, "No, no, I got no man. You have to get some licks right now." Yes, yeah, so. Um, he backed down, but the good thing with the guy is a guy from Brixton. He took me one side and he said, "What go on with you?" Um, because he's a British kid, and he um we chat and we got on. So between him and me and a couple of other guys, we formed a little firm because there wasn't a lot of black guys up in there because this was Suffolk. So the three of us, we enlist one Italian brother, and the four of us decide that we are gonna are set the tone in our school. Started the bullying. <laughs> started, started. So the you people's pocket money and all that, Mister B. Yeah, not directly. They, they would get something for it. So we will sell them something. I protect them. So it's a protection racket. Ish. <laughs> Ish. So Ish. were you that? Were you the real grime of the school then? I, I wasn't the driver behind it. I was just part of the crew that ex that that moved that way. There. But to be honest, you you had to. It was a survival thing because on top of that, the reason why I said there wasn't a lot of black guys there and the, the black guys that, that was there, it wasn't just a matter of we needed to share our Afro home. The locals, they had racists. I got called some names because in Jamaica, I didn't know racism. It wasn't until I come to England that I realised the colour of my skin mm. and the fact that that was an issue for, for others. So mm. racism, there ain't none in Jamaica. You see, I had a white teacher in Jamaica and I didn't even know that the guy was white until I come here and I went back to Jamaica um, as a teenager. I sat down and I reasoned with him and I said, look at you, you got ginger here, spots, everything, you and your kid. But because he taught Jamaican and mm. as a kid growing up, you, you, you know, people call people, yo, white man, come here. But you don't really think of it. It wasn't it's, it's not, Yeah, it wasn't yeah. on that level, but when I got here, Monkey, Coon, Wog, all them names there. It, it was just madness that we had to protect ourselves against that type of type of behavior. So you're in a school, basically, that was a racist school. It was a racist area, and it was the times as well. We're talking the 80s here, so mm. you understand racism in this country was different because we couldn't even go football games them time. Wow. 
try and go to a football match and that was just madness. So you were there for a few years and then you left there and ended up going back home, is that right? I got expelled in the fifth year. <laughs> <laughs> I, they, I, I got, they called the police, you know. Wow. I got so they got quite serious. GBH, um, I wrap a chain around a guy, a proper, that he stole from me and I got a code in life that if you violate my thing, you're going to get revenge. So okay, I go. dealt with him, they uh-huh. called the police, they had a meeting and they decided to expel me from the school. So I ended up back at Acne Downs for the last year of school just to take exams, which, wow. I, which I failed. <laughs> Can I ask you a serious question? Do you regret mm. those days? Yes, no. I, I wouldn't. The only thing I changed them time there is um, making sure that I got the academic grades that I should have got because I'm not a dumb guy. Mm. I've got a master's degree now, but I left school with no qualifications and it wasn't because I didn't know. I think the early onset was being bored because I'd learned advanced in Jamaica and here they were teaching me stuff that was just regurgitating so it didn't get my attention. Um, what, what I'd say I'd change is the bullying aspect yeah. because growing up now, I've met some of the younger guys. I met one particular guy, he's a DJ too, um, Pete, and he told me his story of being at that school, which was totally different to mine. He was on the other end of my gang and he used to run away from school, cry himself to sleep at night. His whole school experience was a horrible one. And when he told me his story, it made me feel really small. I, I, I was not. Because you were a part. Because I was a part of that. Because yeah. I was smiling at the time. When I found out that we went to the same school, I was like, yeah, man, the school is nice and rare. rare. And then he started to tell his story and it just humbled me. I had to just listen and say, you know what? Because of me and my crew and people like us, other kids didn't have such a good time or a good experience. So would you say that the situation now with the youngsters right now, they've been guided the wrong direction. Is that, is that what the real answer is now? Because you're saying that you've been for it, you've done it, you've mm-hmm. worn the t-shirt. Mm-hmm. You can see out there, uh, a bully is no, is no different than a man coming to you with a with a gun or a knife because he's bullying you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So would you say that what's going on now with our youngest is because their guidance isn't right? What there's, would you say? There's a lot of elements to what's going on nowadays and it saddens me, you know. A lot of the time people are quick to say, oh, I blame the parents. But I know some kids who have got both parents and they're in jail for murder. I know some kids who grew up with both parents and they're in jail for robbery, in jail for stabbing, in jail for that. So it's not 100% the parents. The parents do have an element of blame. The key is society and the fact that society has taken away people's ability to parent their child. You got That's the key. But we've also got to look within ourselves at what our issues are and fix those. Missing fathers, that's an issue. 100%. Now, I've got two children. And I've got that because I can afford two children. They're adults now, but at the time. So when I meet a man, a brother, and this is typical, you ask a man, how many children he's got? Boy, <laughs> well, it's eight. From they say about, I've switched off because I can tell you that they don't know their birthdays, what their favorite food is. They never put them to bed at night, read them a story, nothing. So don't buy off more than you can chew. Totally but agree. society now, my kid, when he was 14, I'll tell you a story. I got a call from the school that he was doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. So I went up to school, I talked to the headmaster and we're about to leave it with me, we deal with it. So I'm deal with it the way a Jamaican parent would. That's a Thursday. So you got some lick. Like I said, I dealt with it. I want Jamaican <laughs> parent <to> shoot. <laughs> so <laughs> they're good. That was a Thursday. Saturday morning, I was in the house with my son and the door knocked. I was in the kitchen washing up, so I went to the door now. There was eight officers wow. string along my driveway. They had social services, child protection police, the actual police. Wow. They came because there was a complaint made that oh, I had good. beat my child and they were coming to take him that day. Oh my God. So when I opened the door, I said to them, I said, what? When they said, told me what, when I understood what they were there for, I goes, you know, you know take him. So I call him and I send him. I goes, go on, you know, you know people come for you know. So I let him go out there. Look a while he called me and I went back out there. So they said they wanted to apologize because what basically happened that was a complaint was made by a teacher because they overheard him saying in school, boy, what my dad did, I ain't doing that again. Bear in mind, yeah? A week after the headmaster phoned me to say, Mr. Riley, whatever you did is worked. Your son is moving nice. But they come to arrest me and take my child for doing that. Not abusing him, mm. but giving him a Jamaican 
reprimand. Yeah, 100%. So when I saw that and a good friend of mine, his son got taken from him because he beat his son and he got arrested and spent a time overnight. So do you say, would you say that uh, kids are taking advantage of that knowing that they the family definitely can you get see, yammed? Because Peter, how many times when you were growing up did we was out in a crew and we are going to do something and you'll have a couple of kids say, boy, if my dad find out, no. Nah. And they'll go. Just the threat of it. I'm not yeah. saying that we as Jamaican parents want to go out there and beat our children every day, but we need it. Keep you need the mum to be able to say, wait till your father get home. 100%. Those little things stop children. So it's a deterrent. And if you do come to the stage where you have to beat or give a child that type of discipline, <laughs> because we call it beatings, I think Caucasians and the indigenous people look at it in a bad way and think, wow, beatings, yeah. you know, yeah. but it's not. It's just giving them some licks to straighten them out. It's yeah. nothing, it's not violent. And they said that they stopped corporal punishment in order to stop child abuse. Well, I'll tell you talking has about Has child, child abuse, abuse stopped? No, it hasn't. Child abuse is what the next day, before we go back to your deep story, mm. is I want to tell you, what do you think of the FFF family for, uh, was it family, was it? Friends, family force or something. I this haven't new, got a clue about these guys. Okay, these, the, the, they're like, they're not vigilantes or are they vigilantes? Oh, the guys with the black vest. Yeah. Oh, well, right. What do you think about that now? Do you think it's got a little bit out of hand now where this needs to be done? Um, yes and no again, Terry. You see, um, Peter, sorry. You got two, I got two, you got names. two first you names. <laughs> sorry Everyone about does. that, brother. But yeah, um, with that, yeah, what what is annoying is that we're supposed to be looking to do something unified to change everything. How many different black groups are there? True. We just need the one, thank you. True. That's the problem. People True. will go out there and form another group and form another group. And I've been to some of the meetings. Back in the 90s, Leo Chester and those guys, I used to, you know, I had a mild interest and I came this close to, to signing up to the brother. the nation of Islam. Exactly. Yeah. I came this close to signing up. But what I found was it was all repetitive. It was all talk and there was no action. I wanted an action group. There was infighting, there's disharmony and disunity in more or less the majority of groups that I've had affiliations, discussions, and I've attended the meetings. I've seen floors. So when I see that now, I'm thinking, wow, it's such a shame because we're not going to get anything done unless we're unified. Here's one clear example of what we should do. I always say this to people because it's easy, but it's hard. Now, our problem as black people is inequality, yeah? If you go to anywhere, we're talking about, we're sitting now in council offices, yeah? Mm. Now, if you look in the council offices, you'll think, wow, they're all right, they're diverse. You'll see black people, you'll see all sorts. But come with me to a senior management team meeting. Oh, I'm the only black man in the room Nine out of ten times, I fought Kensington and Chelsea Council for ten years to try and get another black person in their senior management team. Now, this is what I say to black people: you got. Let's just take Nike. Everyone knows Nike. Now, Nike again. You go in their shops. Who cleans their stores? Who black, owns black it? Who, who's behind yeah. the till? You'll see us. Yeah. But yeah. go to a Nike senior management or middle management team None meeting. You won't see us. So let's just say this. All right, Nike. Unless you change your policy and we see us right through your organization, we're going to stop by Nike for a year, mm. six months. Mm. Now, most kids have got enough Nike to not buy Nike for six months and still be all right. Mm. But we continue to support these people who are not supporting us. And it's just not Nike. We're talking Adidas. We're talking McDonald's. We're talking Apple. Any blue chip company, any organization, you name it. We should just say to them, listen, change your staffing structure. I want to see my people throughout or else we're gone. We're not going to give you no custom. Within six months, they'll look at their returns, their balance sheet, their profit margin, and they'll know that black people have not been in there because we are the biggest consumers. End off. And it's things like that, that these groups should be, you know, galvanizing us and doing because in school, what have our kids got to study for? They're still getting the same careers advice we did back mm. in the 80s and 90s. You know, mm. you're going to be a manual worker. Now, I understand to a degree why they wouldn't want to go all out and get qualifications. There's no point getting the qualifications if there's no opportunity for you when you come out of it. Right. What? So that again, so there's so many factors to it. But we, as the elders, I said the other day to friends of mine that 
it's our generation of kids that are going around causing all this madness, killing each other, and they're doing it on our watch. What are we doing? Well, we're not doing nothing. But what I will say is mm. through your boredom, you decided to take on music. How did the music get in there? Was it that after work you used to sit back and say, I'm so bored, someone or your dad or your mum used to play some vinyl and you always had that in the back of your head? Probably, How did that come about? I think it was the Jamaican in me. It wasn't really um, playing music. It was I was a DJ. I used to MC. I was a okay. mime. Yeah, I used to mime, mime. Bad boy MC, I yeah? used to be. I was the world's <laughs> next beanie man in the making. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Um, so that's what I used to you do. You still do no, I get a long I can chat two lyrics, but you know, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Ah, don't. Ah, back in the day, I had a theme tune. The ragamuffin man, 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 the ragamuffin man. Of yeah. Someone can keep in a dance band, the radio, they want to the DJ to come star up the show. That was me. So on, even if you go to um, the late, I'll tell you who made me laugh, the late Robert Allen. Okay. May he rest in peace. Because yeah, right, I used yeah. to go to all the studios, and when he was at Fashion uh, Malam Road, when the studio was there, I used to go with Mafia, Floxy, Gussie. Friendship, all of them and jam and our voice in fashion our voice for sir george our voice for a few of them even king tubby's studio when he was at may street and one time robert allen said to me because when i turned to a dj he said Banton, if i ever clash you i'll just go back to the studio and <laughs> cut some of the, the little rubbish where you're recording and play that back make the people them laugh after you and that was how it was because even anthony briley he, he yeah. nearly because it was me, you? no, he had me, he had yeah. me in his pocket, I was recording in his studio, but one particular track, everybody like it, and Anthony said, more well, release it, and I said, no, nah. because my problem was, you couldn't get the Jamaica feel in the studios here, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't really like the rhythms, and it sounded too, and I wanted a, a song that could mix in with the Jamaican songs, flawlessly, if you listen to the reggae music from the UK back in the 90s, there's a difference in 100%. terms of yeah you see 100%. it so that was the problem but anthony actually done test press of that and it did get a, a little earring but well it you got a lot of earring as well because from that being in the music business hmm. you obviously went on a bit and you decided i want to do some radio now so being into your little mc and all that hmm. how did you transition and go into radio who gave you okay. that first little break there or I, did I, was, work I was emceeing on sound, different sounds. I Can you name some? Uh, Friends Incorporated, Total Experience, Gemma Magic. Friends Incorporated is still going to, today, isn't it? Is it? I doubt it, because Goody was the part, WJ no, Good Groove. Sure. Yeah? Sure. I don't think so, because um, yeah. it was Percy, Good Groove, Squeaky, Brian, and us. It might be another and, uh, one or something. Can I? Yeah, so with Good Groove, I met him when he, about 14 at Chats Palace. He had on shorts. And when I met Goody, he was a MC DJing. So we was doing a stage competition thing and me and him met up and we, we, we start talking. We got on. So Goody used to play at house parties week to week. Him and a guy called Lloyd used to string up sound. So he used to call me. So I used to go and MC for him. So yeah. that's how we were and we were in Friends in Corporate. So you were an MC for his set? MC for his set. Mm. But it was MCing for DJ Mikey that got me into the radio because he was on RJR. And I was emceeing for him. We had Shinolas, which had just opened in yes, Lenny. Yes, yes. And we used to do a residence. Your name was brought up the other day about that, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go on. We used to do a residence in uh, Mingles on a Thursday. Mikey, Trevor Sachs, and Calvin Francis. And I used to be the MC. I used to MC for him and that. And one, and then when the, the whole breakup of RJR came about and they went their separate ways from RJR, Supreme was born, and then Mikey, he formed City Radio. Mm. So he had City Radio up and running, and Good Groove went with him on City Radio, my brethren Squeaky and a few others. He had the likes of James Bond and then people on it, Jesse James. And um, I wasn't on the radio, I was just still doing my MC and whenever he called me on the weekends. And one Thursday we were sitting in Mingles and Mike said, boy, I need a DJ if it was sure tonight. <laughs> so everybody look at me now. And I said, boy, I don't do them things there. I'm a, so they give me a little Guinness. And after the Guineas, I agreed to do the show. So I flew, I didn't even have enough records. I flew to my mate Squeaky's house, and because it was a sound, you know, yeah, you used yeah, to have yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I put together a bag of record there, and I went and done a show the night. And as soon as I done the show, as soon as I said hello, them the start, them mad. start shake off. There was no phone. Oh, oh yeah, was, was no, it mobile text? phone wasn't invented. Was it a text? No text. No penny jail? Nothing. No, it weren't a text. Was there it? was nothing. It was there wasn't paper. No, it was 1980. Pen and paper. Yeah, there were. There That's wasn't it. even pen and paper because 
the pen and paper came about when we had a studio next to our hairdressers. So okay. we used to get people to phone their landline, make the request, oh, yes, and yes, run around with yes, it. Yes, yeah, yes, but, yeah, at that time, we were totally cut off, cut off from the wow. listeners, cut off. So I've done the show. By the time I've done it, everybody's in Oh, my youth, you done? Because, yeah. I was on the radio seven days a week for the next six months after that first show. Every day, Mikey put me on the radio. And what kill it was, you know, I used the same bag of record. Yeah. <laughs> you used the same, same bag of record all the time. All the time. Yeah. And I, I, I brother, Stuart, they call him Oliver, Big Belly Stuart. He said, why you sound good on the radio, you know, you, but you always are playing the same thing. <laughs> So that made you obviously to go and start collecting. That's what got me to the likes of the record shop standing. No, I went to Jemmy Magic, little Andy. Oh, uh, little Andy. He yeah, lent yeah, me yeah. some tune. I went to Fat Man, our blessed father, Fat Man. Fat Man took me to, he had a place up, Roadwater Farm, underneath the, the, the flats. Um, I said to Fat Man, boy, I'm up on the radio you now. <laughs> father, Fat. So he said, yeah. He goes, come. And he took me in his downstairs at the road of farm. Listen, we was just walking along and there was just beer shelves stuck up. Music. Live and love, jammies. Fat man was just taking them down and putting them on top so till my hand get heavy. <laughs> I had to run out, put them in the car, come back. But him, him, Jeremy Magic, those, those people set me on the way in terms of, of getting me started before I start spending money. Wow, <laughs> before yes, I to start spending into the all money. the record shops. As I say, as a soul R&B man, uh, going all around and collecting music it's not an easy thing it it wasn't but it no, had to be done but it was a it had to be done yeah you, you you had we had fun because you had what Rebo records that i had to go to then mnd and dawson then i used to go across to labro grove check reds and 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 then monday up our uh, suit and then i used to have to go across well, talking, Lavender about, Hill. talking about you being um a radio presenter now your name mm. got so huge that you ended up being on every dance or thing that was out there the name brand was mr banton and you seem to be getting in all the clubs is that right it was and i done that for a purpose when i used to go parties them time you soul guys jesus i used to go to some party and go to the whole party not one reggae player for the night and if they did play reggae they'll play a couple lovers lovers rock tunes so in my head i used to get vix i said no nah, man Oh, my people them now get them boom bang so my sheer role was to go in the dance and just wreck it every time and the good news was there were so many that was of a light mind to me they yeah. were all frustrated and none of the DJs them really had the cojones to go and bash hit bashment like I did because bashment was just starting we, yeah. we transitioned from the 80s to the 90s so nobody had would would go in there so i went in there hammer and tongs and it worked the people them were happy so every time i went in there and smashed it down why promoters them start phoning me but it wasn't that to get there in the first place when i went on the radio um peter i started to spend money on 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 records i started saying what weird i spend money and now i make no money from this so I used to get a little 15 pound to, to MC for, for sound and rare edits and 10 pounds. But 15, sometime. 20 pound in them days was a lot it of money. It was a lot of money because it was, it was either that or a bag of weed and two beer. Yes, you, 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 yes, those were yes, the kind so of nice. payments. But I wanted, and I was spending like 60, 70 pound a week initially. It was a drug. It was, but that went up to 100, 150 pound a week on record. So I had to earn that back. And what I did was I walked around the clubs. I went to Oasis in Dawson Lane Dawson, I yeah. spoke to Derek the white guy and he said his Friday and Sunday was nail up but he gave me a Saturday he said do a promotion and we'll work from there and the, the best thing I done was go and knock on the door of Maxims Anthony Brightly may God bless that man <laughs> and opened Mr. the door Bra- for you I just you see one successful dark man. brother with all I could see was teeth <laughs> <A> smile <laughs> So I look in, I go, yeah, boy, my name's a one time, we are the hottest thing. I'm a one DJ in a your club, come here, say your club. Anthony started laugh. But it was known for a fashion but place. He called it? me in. Yeah. We sat down and he said to me, all right, because them days, seven days a week, you could play out. So he said, the only day I got is a Tuesday, so we can try out on a Tuesday. So I said, all right, he goes, I got a next young DJ and want to try him out too. Come next Tuesday. So Anthony done what he had to do. So the next Tuesday I went there. You know who the other DJ was? Who was it? President Sass. Oh wow. <laughs> it was funny right, because team. I just see this guy 
Margalex, skinny, and, and he, yes, yes and that, 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 that's my brother. Bobo yeah. will tell you, say, me and yeah. Sass is like peas and pod. He may his soul rest in eternal peace, but I see this guy with shorts on, and I said, I just see the legs because uh, Maxim's at the stage, innit? And I said, where this brother with this Marga leg are doing a shot? And, it, and then when I look up, he made big, yeah. big and round, President Sasso. The, the dance, we was playing basically to the bar people and the security because it was empty. It was a Tuesday night. So me and Sass, we start talk and he was an MC to a mic man. So we start spit some lyrics and we just hit it off from there and then. And Anthony said after the night, you know what? Uno good. The car, nobody not there, but in a still entertain we rare ready. So not so he gave me a, a go with Jemmy Magic and Dubbug on a Wednesday as guests, smashed it up. Then he gave me a this is what made me Valentine's night. I can't remember what year, 89. 89, I think it was. In Maxims, Mr. Banton, special guest with Funky Jamaican Express. When I tell you that Funky Express was up there every Friday, they locked the place, lock it. Put Mr. Banton special guest, the queue was going up to Stoke Newton that right. night there. When I reached there, Lord, and when I got in Maxims, security had to carry me to the box. I couldn't, it was sardine up in there. Celebrity at the sardine moment. up in there. So Mikey, they never know me. So then I wonder, who this this little manga boy you know pushing in our, our, our thing. So I said hello, polite, rare, rare, this and that. But we never really talk. So when I'm my time for play now, listen to me. I took off the roof off of Maxims on Valentine's Day. My kid, all of them come shake off my ass. <laughs> That's kid. funny, I remember I can't just come and wicked. greet you straight away, but because of your popularity and that somebody mm. decides they want to be your friend now, isn't that a bit frustrating? It is, because I've been introduced to people like, some people have gone, yeah, this is, and before they say the name, the, the look they give you and the dismissal, and then as soon as the Mr. Banton come out, oh, respect, respect. Yeah. Them people they have to say hello I move on. Yeah. I haven't got time for none of that full stamp because they just want to know somebody because yeah. they're a person. I prefer you have to respect and treat. With me, from the CEO to the janitor, you get the same treatment when you're dealing with me. Well, the treatment carries on from that because after covering all the club, you went on another big station, didn't you? And you did that for a number of years. Uh, with my belief, I don't mm. know if it's this way around, it happened to be Station FM, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Now, 1991, the, the DTI went around and they wrote letters to all the pirate radio station owners at the time and said, look, they changed the legislation, they introduced jail terms, £2,000 fines, etc. And they said everybody had to switch off come the 31st of December 1991. And everybody did. And with good reason, because some of these guys, they had their houses raided by the police and DTI and stuff stole, taken away, etc. So they really put the frighteners on it. So everything, there was not one pirate radio station operating in January 1992. Keatley come to me. At the time I was working in um, high tech in Dawson and Keatley, he came with the Keatley attitude and said he don't care. <laughs> he must string up. So I said, if you're stringing up, it's way stringing up, son. So we get our coax and everything, hit Holly Street, roofs, set up in our one yard, bam, by February. In January, we had everything ready to go, but it wasn't until February we switched on for a test. And it was a small team at the time, but me, Keatley, Governor General, went on the roof, put on the thing, and Station FM was born. And it was the only pirate radio station on because everybody switched off. Because I used to go to some DJs and they used to say, yeah, you're coming on. They said, boy, with them fines, man was scared to go on the radio then. But my attitude was right alongside D very carefully. At the time, I scared myself because I would have kill, kill people to play my music. I nearly did kill somebody, Governor General, and Keatley stopped me. I was that serious because I come here from Jamaica, Rodigan and Tony Williams wasn't making it. I needed more. I needed reggae Monday to Sunday. So when certain people was trying to stop that, I took it personal and I got angry. I wanted to, you know, no, we deserve to have our music represented at all times on the radio. So that was me. I would, I would have gone to jail if it wasn't for Keatley. I wouldn't be here talking to you, car. 
How old was I then? Must have been early 20s. They would have given me life. So <laughs> you would have interviewed me and I'm a striped suit. Would you say you've had some rocky times though? Because as obviously within the music game, we have people that want to, as you said, they'll sit, they'll look at you. Mm. Even though they hear who you are mm. and they look at you. Somewhere. I've had moments and stories that I could tell you that are not pleasant stories. Cause tell me. Being in the business, this is your story. You, you have to. I hear you, but don't have to say names. No, some some of the individuals, promoters that try and withhold your money and things like that, and try and short you. Because I was a man that I used to charge 150 pound. End of. You're booking me. That's how much I charge, and I used to get away with it. People used to have to pay that. There were friends that were promoting dance and regulars that I might say, all right, give me 100 or 120 pound. But at the end of the day, the money had to pay for my music and everything. So. Dealing with those guys was an issue. I had an issue one time when I was in the prison and one promoter, he tried to short the money, 20 pound. And- Where's the principal? It was a principal, because the club was full. I don't know what his issue was, but I said, no, nah, keep it. When I take it, and a room full of boy them come, so I'm talking them brother, rare, rare, this and that. So they tried badding me up in there, and I'm me one. So I said, you know what, brother? Either I walk out of this room here with the money where we agree, or I walk out of here with no money and we deal with it later. So I'm saying, what a bad man, Ray Ray, this and that. I was, I'm not a bad man. I'm just explaining that I made a deal with you for that. Mm. It's either that, boy, I hate to pawn it, Ray Ray, this and that. So I goes, all right, I'm gone. So I went out and I start pack up my things and Andy B come, boy, man, and them one day some bad man, some wicked man from Ray Ray. I go, they could have a wicked little more. Let me walk out of here. If I ain't got a hundred pound, then we've got a, a, a problem, problem later on. Yeah. So in the end, they paid up. But it's, it was just that. The you principal, had to flex. Just to show you were a boy. Flex. Well, even, bless him, Bogan, Pier One, he'll tell you, because Bogan used to try it. Even when he have money in his pocket, because I'm rich. <laughs> when he used to have Pier One, yeah, he used to come and he always used to try and get a little 15, 20 pound short change at, at, at paying you. Because I, I used to get away with it with them soul, man, but not with me. You know what I did to Bogan the first time he tried that? I said, all right, I'm going to take a buckle then, some um, brandy to make it up. And I think he was about 30 pounds short the morning there. So um, Bogan goes, all right then. Yeah, brandy. So when me get up for walk out now, I took up two bottles of brandy. So, oh, wait, where are you going? I goes, listen to me. I goes, yeah, I done said to you, so I'm going to take up brandy. He goes, yeah, but I one buckle of brandy. I turned to me of the brandy. I goes, listen, you bought them at the wholesalers, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to show them that yeah. they can't violate. So I did get a reputation as if you're booking me, pay me. At the end of the day, some used to start paying me in advance and give you deposits. But I don't think it's, it's a bad thing because it's business at the end of the day. Look at what's happened to the DJ business now. Uh, man's paying, playing out for free, for chips. And I saw that because the, the promoters used to um, book me for the stage shows. Uh, Mikey and them big promoters. And I used to charge them hundred pounds because it was a big show. I wasn't the star. When you got Beanie Man, Barty Killer, and them artists coming you in, you just want to be on the bill. The Mr. Bantons just warming up. Nobody mm. cares who warm up. So hundred pound is nothing. But then one time, Mikey never booked me for one particular show. So I goes, "Well, I go on." I was sitting down with Anthony and Robert and the rest of them, ARM, and they said, "Boy, Banton, when I'm getting them money for fifty pound, what am I paying you hundred pound for, really, though?" And I've got big artists in our hotel to pay a bill. <laughs> I goes, "Who's doing it?" So they expose. Yeah. DJ and some of the names of DJ that's taking small change chicken feed I don't know why they're doing it because because of their actions mm. it's made it the way for everybody else and people want to buy dub plate these days so if you're spending that kind of money on dub plate and alright they get a buy with the, the download because everybody seems to be ripping off the music industry and not paying for it mm. but they're paying for dub plates so they're still paying out of money so they have to earn that back in the form of playing out. So I, I just don't know how they are surviving these days. They've sold themselves out. DJ is trying to, you know, get in, muscle in, or, you know, make a little name for themselves. I always say that if your talent is a DJ, it will shine through, you'll come through. One of the stories then, you will know about this, the syndicate, you've heard that name. <laughs> now, that's all I kept hearing about, the syndicate, the syndicate. And what's wrong then, with the syndicate? The syndicate comprised of, what's that Greek brother them? Tar Carlos, CJ, and them man there, Mystery and them people there. And it was as if, um, but the syndicate only applied to you guys. 
because CJ Carlos had to book me <laughs> outside of the syndicate. Valentine's after you see what I done murdering up um the the, the, the Maxims on Valentine's. CJ come to book me to play in Laces in West End on a Tuesday night till six o'clock in the morning. It was be a soul man that was on the on the dance there, legs and then Monday, you know. And I was the only guy in there to do a reggae set. And you have to have that because what I used to love Tyson Street, them kind of Ruby Center. Then Monday, about three soul sound used to come on and back to back soul, you know. So by the time I put the needle on that record, them people in there that like reggae, yeah, all of the the noise that used to come out, one woman, one morning, she took a gun out of her baggy and start fire. <laughs> I'm telling you, I kid you not. That night, I'll never forget. Lady Saw was here at the concert that night, and I was playing at Tyson Street, so I was pissed because Lance told me that he wanted me there early. So I went there now, and I must have played one o'clock. I never played again. I managed to get on again at three o'clock and do a little set. So I done a half an hour at three o'clock, and that was it. So then I play back to back, back to back. And I'm not telling you that all the sounds them come on and made the same mistake. And about seven o'clock, just after seven in the morning, DJ Ratty was coming on. And I say, Ratty, you my good youth. You must break the chain. No, Ratty come on, start really grooving it out. So by the time I got on set at eight o'clock, all the people them had come from the lady saw. So you started to see a little set of Jamaican looking people, let's just say, <laughs> arrive in the morning. So I come on eight o'clock in the morning and this is five hours odd, beer R&B. And when that Dennis Brown hit the nickel and start playing, Lord God, the woman took out her gun and start shoot up wow. in that to show appreciation. That's how it was, but. But that's what happens in Jamaica, doesn't it? Oh, they, they don't understand that. In Jamaica, we're at open air events, but. Mm. Even when I used to play in small places like Chimes when Anthony had it, I was in there one night with Stone Love and um, Rodigan and some gunshots started fire and appreciation. And me, when the club done, me oh, and Anthony, nah, you could see that the, the bullet ricochet off yeah. the ceiling and perforate the heater. And this is a heater at the That's bar lucky. that people used to sit along it. That's so lucky. me and Anthony look they could have gone and hit someone. Somebody could have dead out of mm. somebody enjoying their music. So. It was stupid that they didn't understand that. Yes, I'm all for gunshot in an open air event because in Jamaica I'm used to it. Firecrackers, all up on nice gunshot are blaze. But here, if you're inside of a building, know that you're going to kill somebody if you don't know what you're doing. Well, you've still been killing up the vibes, but you did it for a little while and then you decided, um, I want to step away from this now. Why did Mr. Banton? Because we could talk to Mr. Banton about all the big things that you've done. Mm. Mr. Banton has also got his private life as well, mm. obviously working and stuff. And also, for, yeah. for some reason, Mr. Banton turned into a Christian as well. But first and foremost, I would like to know, why did Mr. Banton decide he wants to change his act? It, it wasn't a decided to change. Um, with the DJing, it was always a hobby for me. I've always had a career outside of that. Um, my career is within housing um, management, local authorities has always been my forte. And about, I think it was 2000, I can't remember the exact year, but it got to a point where uh, one of the directors that I work with told me basically that I'm wasting my time being an officer and it's time for me to step up into management. So I didn't agree with him, but he was quite convincing in what he said. So I started housing management. And um, I then decided that I needed to get some qualifications, so I wanted to do a master's degree. And obviously, anybody who's done it, studied, knows that a master's degree is one below a PhD, and that's some hardcore studying. So I done the diploma initially while I was on the radio, which was quite, you know, difficult. But I managed to do the two. This but is when it came to the masters. There was no way. Yeah. Um, there was no way I was going to be able to, to complete a master's degree and be on the radio. Master's degree, what is this club time? When everyone's raving Friday night, 10 to 4 in the morning, I'm on my computer knocking out an assignment. So I had to leave the radio to actually do that. But the plan was always to study and then come back. I thought it was possibly it might have scared you that you'd get caught in the studio and it wasn't worth that the was risk. Never. Listen to me. 
I didn't know that Station FM had started the very first talk show in the history of talk shows. It wasn't till me and Keatley played at Red Bull Music Festival over at the Orbital. Yeah. We were being interviewed and we were being given the history. Now, the first ever radio talk show was me and Andy B, the Labra show. Now, that was started by accident. And it was started because I'm a rebel and I was there in the studio waiting for DTI to dare come in there. Because <laughs> they had raided Andy's show twice yeah. and find him. So Andy B was at the point where he said, boy, I'm not going on the radio. So I said to him for his Wednesday show, I will come in. Because I used to be on nine till 11. He was on seven till, till nine. So I said, I'll come in two hours early and police the thing. And any DTI come, we'll deal with that for you. That was how I got Andy to say. So the first couple of weeks come in, Andy did his show, I'll come on. Little while I got bored. So I said, let's play half hour reggae, half hour soul, half reggae till 11. Because Andy, even though I finished, he, he used to stay in the studio with yeah. me. And then one day we said, ah, oh, child, let's, the live link come now with the, the mobile phone because we never had the live link. So we said, let's hook them up. So we asked people to tell us labrish. It was about, you know, tell us who's sleeping with who and that kind of sus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And people, first couple of weeks started to phone in and give us two little tidbits and rare, rare. And then, I don't know, from where, the callers started to come in with some argument like, um, uh, I want to talk about, is it all right for black men to date white women and all that? Because that, them, them kind of topics yeah, were prevalent yeah. then. And, you know, what, what, what would you do if your son came home and say they were gay? So all, the, all these topics were coming in and we found that it went on till 11. People just bum, bum, bum. So I know Keatley must have seen it because him jumped in straight away. <laughs> and the next minute, it was me and Keatley that was um, doing the show. But we done that, the library show, and there's hours of footage of it. And I've got, I went in my attic last year i got a bag of letters that people wrote in to us with topics and stories and some of the lives that we touched and changed and it's a real humbling read i keep saying to keely that i want to give him the letters because it's in my attic and everything in my attic is there till i dead my kids is going to be dealing with that so i'd rather give it to somebody who can put it somewhere because these letters some of them are quite eye-opening but I was a rebel. It wasn't a case. I, I went in the studio to protect Andy. I used to drive past our studio. I used to drive past Clapton Police Station, Stoke, and look in the backyard to see. Because the DTI, you'd have to go to the police station, get up. the police, and then come and raid us. So I used to drive past to see if I see them. One time, I see them in a Clapton station. So I phone Keely. I fly to the, 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 the site. And by the time I reached there now and got there, they was just rocking up with, with us now. So I only got time to unplug the thing. I didn't even get to take it out. I had to put dash it one side to hide it. So them flying, they reached there. I said, how you not? You know, no, but it's things like that. I remember I was anti-establishment. If you told me that it had on a uniform and it was telling me to go left, I'm the guy walking right. And it's funny because being a housing officer now, it, you wouldn't have thought that you transitioned would never to the local would government. Never have thought that. But yeah, I, I didn't. The, the, the music was a case of my career was more important. And from doing that, I went into the mentoring of the kids. And then you said I, I, that I'm a Christian now. I wish I was a born again, baptized Christian. I visit church maybe four out of five times per month. I try to go every Sunday. I'm part of a church. Now, with that comes the volunteering with the rough sleepers, the night show at work and things like that. And working with these vulnerable people because we've got time on our hands. I go to the gym hour a week. I go to badminton every Wednesday. And I can fit all these things in. Whereas most people say, oh, I ain't got time. You have got time. Mm. The amount of time you sit down. I know one girl, yeah, she watches... Coronation Street, <laughs> Emmerdale Farm and EastEnders, yeah? Religiously. And I said to her, count how many hours a week of your life you're sat in front of that, wasting. Because they take up about, what, three, four hours an evening. Easy, yeah. Every day. Yeah. So me, I haven't got time for that kind of stupidness. I'd rather go out there and do something that's going to make a difference. And mentoring kids. There's not enough of us out there mentoring kids. And... What I learned from that is that the knowledge you've got, that I've got, we take it for granted, but don't pass it on. I'm talking about helping kids with simple little things like how to negotiate in the workplace, mm. corporate behavior, how mm. to fill out the actual application form to get the job in the first place. These mm. are basic skills that 
we think everyone knows, but our kids don't. At 14, 15, 16, those ages, we need to sit down and start talking to our kids about that. I was blessed. My mum, I'll always go back to her because she was an evangelist, mm. but she's also a teacher and she worked for social services in foster and adoption. She also went to university during bringing us up four because my dad, bless him, he wasn't the greatest. So she did all the work. Mm. But she sent us to school when I come to England seven days a week. Monday to Friday, we went to school. My mum was a teacher at Saturday school, so we had to attend Saturday school. We got enhanced maths and English. We also got black history. That's where we learned where we're coming from and what, what we're doing. And then there was Sunday when the van used to come and take us to Sunday school. So we used to hate her for that. But as an adult, I love my mother for putting me through that. We've lost Saturday schools for our kids. We've lost the youth clubs for our kids. So how, you know, they've got a postcode war going on. They're fighting for SW17, for E6, for N10, for that. Why the hell? Makes you want to cry, doesn't it? I've got housing estates that I've managed, um, Peter, that they've split the estate, like one side of the estate is on one side of the road and the other side is the same name. The two estates are at war. So kids from one estate can't walk across to the other without being stabbed. Now, where the hell did all of that come from and stem from? I, I really don't know, but we have to stop it. It's up to us. The government are not... Got black kids out there killing other black kids. Come on. The police don't give a shit. Because all it is is one's dead, the other one's going to jail, so we've got two off the street. Mm. If they don't care, the government don't care, because there's a... Well, that's why I was saying that this new group that's formed now, this yeah. FFF, mm. um, to be patrolling the streets mm. helping the situations where you know mums and yeah. dads are too busy or they see more right what strikes me with them is the the type of uniform they have with the vest they got a stab vest on yes. the black stab yes. vest now that can be seen or construed in a certain way you've also got the CGC the consortium of black men businessmen that's a new also, one that's just they're cool. investing in different groups there's Aren't many they investing in the fff though i don't know. they are that's part that's of their part investment. of them isn't it what yeah. they their plan is to invest but they're all millionaires or something yes they, well right. maybe not millionaires I'm but they got money. i wish they all were because that would be good but whatever money can be thrown at it it does re- need resourcing but it's about finding the right groups to do the right things and there's no point going out there doing things that's not being effective mm. and it's a case of stopping them getting whenever I deal with kids yeah if I say I've got 10 youths that's giving me an issue on an estate I'll go into some of the stairwells because I'll get phone calls and my officers tend to be too scared to approach them so sometimes I'll get a call and I might go on site as a manager to just you know support the staff well, because they know you come from the streets so that's right? the other thing but I would go in there and if there's 10 kids in there I can save eight there's always one or two that boy they will stab me to death now if I was to blink wrong. Why and do you I have think, to acknowledge no, that. You see, you just said that. Mm-hmm. Why do you think? Is it because some people say it's an ego thing? Is it because they will get stripes if they stab the housing officer that comes no. in to talk to them? I'm Why not, do you feel they would do that to you? Because there's always one. That's all it is. There's I always have, one. There, no, no I, I can't give it any other name that in everything I've gone... I've, I've been on estates and dealt with kids that where there's a guy, Daniel, he got shot and his brothers were there and they're all looking to take revenge because we know who shot him, everybody knew. So that, then there's a stabbing where we're there, we know who stabbed him, we know why, etc. So I'm there at these situations. So it's war against kids. It is. Kids and but kids are when you've got a group of them, if you talk to them all, there's always one or two that they do not want to hear it. There's no intervention. There's nothing you can do. So with those kids, you know, the cynic and the horrible person in me will say, you might as well just kill that or just send it to Guantanamo Bay. Because all it's going to do is infect the others and turn another one like it. Recently, I was in Jamaica, me and my brother, um, before lockdown. (laughs) We were talking about the same thing 
the problems with kids and there was this guy there a real bad man in a jamaica one of them is a security for the area done so hear him to, to me and my brother because he must have heard our conversation because you know um we could have cleared up the whole of the problem in this world you know what we need just two chop <laughs> <laughs> two chop so we're gonna mean two chop he goes i just drive around at night time i said listen who not behave and go them yard or go on the yard now anybody say bay i not do it straight away them in the chop and once that them in the chop you now see them Come again miss Come <laughs> miss Come and miss the way he said it he had a point mm. it was cold but mm. boy for all the intervention programs that's costing millions mm. this guy only needs two chucks i can mm. do that <laughs> but, but talk, it's bad it's bad but talking about of course you know with your journey as amazing as it is there's three elements that i always like to say and it's called could you tell us the good parts of mr banton in like your musical career or your life mm. the good parts i had uh, I what i enjoyed yeah what i enjoyed was um the, the the ability to be able to showcase my talent around the world go into different countries and play now experiencing it the, the, the best experiences were um foreign countries germany switzerland france those type of places where the people didn't speak english the first time i i played abroad i i was in a dance and because in england you know when you turn down the music and the crowd sing i was in this venue in stuttgart and there was thousands of people in there rice grain and i come on now i start play and they seemed like they were having a great time but every time i turned down the music it was silent so I must have start cuss them saying, why, why I'm too honorary? And then a few girls that was English speaking saying, oh, don't worry, you're doing good. It's just that they don't understand the, the, the language. So that's why. But I went to a park in, in, in Stuttgart with Morgan Heritage um, were on stage and they had an album out at the time. And there was people in this park singing the album word for word and they couldn't speak English or conduct a conversation, but they knew all the words. So those things, being able to showcase my talent around, because up and down the country as well, playing in from Gloucester to Birmingham, yeah. to all over yeah. the place, yeah. just touring. And you've interviewed a lot of artists as well. Let me show your biggest artist you've interviewed. I don't know if if, if, if it's really big. I ain't had, had Michael Jackson in or nothing like that. <laughs> You know, I think all of them, because yeah. you, you name it, all the top artists at the time, you know, Caperton come in, Barty, Beanie, Lu Luciano was one of my favourite interviews because he came early and he came with his producer, a yeah. guy called Phyllis Fatis Burrell. And I'd always been a fan of um, Fatis Burrell because he was a producer that I liked the way he, he done his rhythms. So they came in and they came in early. So I had Luciano sitting in the studio with me basically and we were talking and smoking and just reasoning. But what, what was making it, and I wish somebody had recorded it in the background, all the songs I was playing, Vegas, Bounty, you name the artist, Luciano was singing it in the background. So I could hear him, but nobody else could. <laughs> and it's like hearing Sim Simmer. Well, they're just normal people. Luciano's. Really? No, but hearing his voice, tone of voice, um, interpret oh, the song. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, something that I'll never forget. But the worst interview I had was Merciless. <laughs> what, what I stopped it dead in its tracks. This guy kept saying, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. <laughs> So I basically was trying to have a conversation. A lot of mercy, what do you do? And you know, Lord of mercy, man, a wicked man from it. You know, trying to talk like Bounty Killer, who I'd met at 18, by the way, and had a pleasant chat with him yeah. and Jamie. So when this guy come along merciless, I thought you're a fool. And um, I'm, I'm having to interview him through this Lord of mercy. So I took the, the mic down and I, and I said to him, look, if you say Lord of mercy one more time, this interview done. So I put the mic up and I go, so yes, merciless, what? He goes, Lord of mercy. So I goes, we're going to a break right now. Chum. After the break, we'll be talking to Cape Town. Chum. And I took the break. So big up for in the studio, in the scene now. They said, no, man, no oh, disrespect. I goes, listen to me. What part of Lord of mercy one more time doesn't he understand? I goes, listen, either Cape Town gets interviewed next or everybody clear my studio, let me do my show. So, and you were big property at that time. It wasn't so. big property. He was on my turf. That's right. And he was disrespecting and violating the thing. Baby Wayne, may he rest in peace. Shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but I think it's probably 
the narcotics that made him behave in that yeah, way, yeah, but yeah. He, he wasn't a pleasant character. What what I hated was being a fan of an artist and then meeting them and they turned out to be a right dickhead. <laughs> but that didn't happen a lot, but it can happen because you know you can revere somebody in the public, yeah. but that person privately is, is not have you, great. Have you ever um, met Five Cartel? No, yes, not met, but I've seen him live once. But you never he interviewed him? Never interviewed him because he was kind of later, but I would have been able to had he not got himself into trouble. Yeah. But by, by his, his error, I was kind of already kind of easing down because I remember being in Jamaica when Vibes Cartel and Sasko first come on the scene. This was 98, 97, them kind of times when they, if they had any records out, they had one. I don't think they did, but. It was a talent show and yeah. they were chatting on stage and m- sitting on the wall with my cousins and then re- they actually you know when you hear something and you stop it who's that sasko when assassin first come on stage he was marga skinny and he would just spit for fun and then cartel come on again dark he could just see his eyes and his teeth and he's up to the top he was bad so i thought wow and i come back to england and victor v would tell you i said to victor these are uh, look out for these names these guys are coming our way and like and and they did but i didn't ever get to to interview kato i'm not saying that what do you think about the dance or artists that seem to have beef about their personal lives and stuff that they put all on social media or someone tries to out them what's your views are you still on the uptake of or what goes on in jamaica on the- i am because um i've got majority of families still there and as soon as they raise the lockdown, I'm gonna have to find a thousand pounds to buy my ticket because they're taking <laughs> a mickey with these prices. But what I what I've I've always said to people is that how do you think a Jamaican artist earns their money? Now, back in the day, they used to cut records. Mm. They used to make a small change out of that, if anything. The majority of that will go back to the street producers and other people. So the only way an artist really has got to make money in this is to do a show, stage show. That's it. Now, I've explained earlier about the issues I had as a DJ getting money from promoters. I could understand that the Mm. artists are probably in a similar fashion. So you've got talented artists who some of them are household name in reggae circles that they're not earning shit. They seem big, but transferring that into pounds is nothing. So most artists have to have some form of side hustle. And sadly, you've got extortion, you've got um, drug running, gun running, you've got all sorts of different nefarious activities. So basically what you're saying, and people need to understand within the music business, don't believe for hype. Well, no. All I'd say is if you want to change that, don't download their music for free, pay for it. Mm. Don't expect a man to gear a hook up or break into the stage show. Pay for your ticket and, and go. Support. Actually support. Put money in the industry for the industry to survive. Because at the moment, reggae is on its knees. And if you look at Jamaica for the last year and a bit lockdown, we survive on tourism. There's been no tourists on the island. So these people are weak. All these stories about people eating dog and all type of thing. If I was still in Jamaica, trust me, a dog me to eat because I'm not what am I going to dead when the dog fat mm. so for me whether it's true or not I don't know but for me if you're telling me they're eating ants and fly I would have a bowl of ants and fly now if I needed to eat a bowl of ants and fly people who live in you know their castles and yeah. their rare rare they don't understand real ghetto when, when, when you're hungry you're hungry and you eat so I could I, I can't imagine the state of affairs. My family that's there, I'm lucky in that they're in industries like agriculture, farming, and a couple of them have been shipped out to the US to earn money. And the ones who are in hospitality, they're struggling because mm-hmm. the hotels are closed, so they don't need them. Has COVID hit Jamaica really badly? It's not that it's hit it badly. It's just that without tourists, the you people, the higglers, them. The, if the, the, the country survives on mm. tourism mm. people who go to Jamaica will tell you this from you walk from A to B you'll have about 10 man women trying to sell you something because they need it to feed their family mm. so that's that, that's the issue there with it but reggae music right now um, it's at its worst in terms of what I've seen I can't name so both of you going to your bags what do you feel about you know 
I personally might be a little bit ignorant. I take my hat off to people like David Radigan, mm. being that he's a white gentleman and he's taken over the reggae facility. He's really tore it apart. He's made a name for himself. Mm. He's classed as a sire in the reggae industry. You as a DJ, coming mm. from the beginning and working your way right to the top, mm. um, what's your views on that type of thing? Well, um, he, he is a controversial character, David, but I, I share a very good relationship with Rodigan. I first met him again with Keith Lee, we was playing in Palm Tree, mm. and I met Rodigan there and played with him and we had a conversation afterwards and he told me that, yeah, you, you sound good. So I told him, listen to me on the radio and we'll talk. So I met him years later with Stone Love and that, and we had a conversation. He goes, yes, Mr. Banton and Ray Redison. So we start talk. We had a good relationship. But this is what with Rodigan, yeah? When I come to the country, I said it was him and Tony Williams won. So yeah. I give thanks to Rodigan for doing that. Yes. And I've heard so many R. people R. hating to Tony, as well. Tony the late Tony yeah, Williams. Tony yeah, Williams. bless him. Yeah. People, um a controversy about Rodigan, but leave Rodigan alone. That's what I'm saying. Leave him. I don't care what it is, yeah? He's a white man playing reggae. So what? He's done enough to, to earn his stature. And regardless whether you like, people saying, oh, he's taking... A black man couldn't have done what Rodigan... Rodigan did what he did because he's white. And I'm not hating on him because of it. I'm glad because it's elevated mus our music yeah. to, to audiences that wouldn't have reached before. And if he hadn't have done that, it wouldn't have allowed the likes of me and others to eat food because he's, he's created audience and bases. I was at um, Oliver Samuel's inauguration at the Jamaica Embassy last year or the year before. And when I met Seth, what's his name? The Jamaica High Commission. When he spoke about David Rodigan and some of the work that Rodigan does, because Rodigan was there that Rodigan does in Jamaica unbeknownst so to... So a lot of charity stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Him spending money back. So it's not like Rodigan has just been taking money from it. He's invested in Jamaica more than the people them who's cussing him off to say, what are Rodigan do? Rodigan, no, sir. Loud the brother, man. Until you walk a mile in a man's shoes, leave it. Rodigan, like him or, or love him, he's done more for reggae, more good for reggae than any harm that you can dream up that he may have done. Mad. Mm. What's your badness? Bad bits in the industry? Um, the bad mind, jealousy. I mean, I think that DJs and sound men have got a special gene in them. Most of them. Not all of them, but the majority. To stay in the game. To stay in the game, you got there's some narcissistic, egotistical gene that they want to be the superstar and everybody else fails. Do you see it today? I don't know because I'm not on it. But right up until me leaving, and part of me not having the heart for it was that if I'm playing at a dance, I want the whole night to go well. My only thought is for the person who paid whatever the money is at the door, who came to enjoy themselves, that they had a great had night. A great time. Now, DJs and soundmans out there, the majority of them, they want sounds to flop around them and for when they to go on to shine so that the next day, every boy, DJ, my man, mash up the dancing, ah oh boy, the rest of them flop. Not me. The whole night's got to be good. So if five sounds on the bill, I want five sounds going in there, firing up the place. So the people come and say, boy, I had a wicked night. So they're not coming out there. And too many times, boy, Banton, mash up the dance, you know. While it's nice to hear as Mr. Banton, I want to hear that the whole dance is nice, not just that one segment of it. DJ John, DJ Bob, DJ Sue, everybody played their part. So if there's one thing I hate was just the attitude of soundmen and DJs that Egotistical. Yeah, they want it all for themselves when it's a big cake. Everyone can eat, you know, allow people and support each other in it. There needs to be more love by keeping up animosity and hate. It ain't gonna further your career and it ain't gonna get you anywhere and it ain't gonna change nothing. So you might as well walk with love and you know support your fellow DJ and someone. So with the badness you have the ugly. Does the ugly and the bad stay together? Or can it get really ugly? Back in the day you could rattle me easy and um now I'm a calm person. I'm a man with four grand boys and I'm calm. And I would say that to rattle me, you'd seriously, before, you know, road rage, step on your shoe and a dance, you know, look at you wrong, all them type of stupidness there, you used to want to get up for. But now, 
you'd have to seriously violate i think you'd have to touch one of my children or grandchildren for me to get up other than that i look at the bigger picture because through the mentoring yeah what i always see every time when i look at a child that i'm dealing with that's just been charged with killing another child they're in tears they're bawling they're speaking are you that, you don't hang know on, that stop person there. sorry are you on. saying the boy that just did the crime yeah when he's realized what he's done no when he knows what's going to happen to him have you never seen the perpetrator of a killing once they've been caught and they're on their own in a police cell or in a holding tank you see this is good for you this to is say this. a baby you would never think that that same per you actually start to feel sympathy every time i've dealt with untold cases because i spent what's we in 2021 since 20 um coming up 20 odd years 20 just over 20 years in housing management and dealing with asb and killings and murders of kids and every single perpetrator looks like a child i've never seen one that say yeah me a bad man me murder him come lock me up let me i'm gonna take my punishment right not one so they're all they do it, why no do they do at it? the time it's being done that's where we have to get to them because some of the conversations when i say to them go back to that time they're in an angry state of mind they're not actually thinking it through they usually have their little crew gene them up around them and that's what makes them do it so if we could get to them their mindset and show them the after at that point or keep instilling the after and some of these kids that they've got locked up that have then gone on to get 20 25 life for murder they their stories will help the others not to and if they're being honest or we were to take footage from the initial interaction with them when they've just been caught it would actually help others to say why why don't you do that bro? it's um i work with the police metropolitan authority i also work with social services you've got safeguarding issues you've also got um freedom of information data so basically what you're There's saying the whole realm of legislation so that, what you're basically saying if that did does and their stuff does get exposed you could top them over the edge to want to commit suicide no it's just that legislation prevents us from doing that basically there's, so too, much, stop, there's too much red tape in, in, in that Absolutely. what we would need is for them to voluntarily say they want to tell their story. To the story but at that point it's too late they're being banged up mm -hmm. and if you see the the prison system nowadays that's just crazy you got guards that are leaving cell doors open for man to get beat up right now that's what's going on in the prisons wow so it's just the the, the, the patients are actually running the hospital right now Wow. And the government doesn't care because it's black kids on black kids. Wow. That's nice. I keep going back to that, but that seems to have become a focus yeah. in my life, you know. And w when I was playing out, when we had youths around us, there's a splash every Wednesday. We used to kill that. We used yes, to have the youths. We used to do the all days down um, Ashwin Street and that. We used to have kids, you know, teenagers around us all the time and try and mold them and, and get through to them. But if you were to put on a dance like that now, I would hate to, I would be, my, my, be would be my mouth, I would be, be thinking, please God, don't let anyone lose their life. Because yeah. it just seems as if we couldn't put on an event with, for kids now yeah. and get that kind of vibe. Well, it used just, to happen at the pavilion, didn't it? Palace Pavilion. Palace pavilion. That and was crazy. Right. That, now, was mad. that was the start of it. So to, real to a degree. Start to a degree. You're that right. was mm. the start of it. Mm. More on the grime and it was... It was. <laughs> it did get an arm out of hand but look what, what we've done as a result yeah we now have no venues whereas Nothing. we had all the venues in the world there's no venues now because we've single-handedly gone out there and you know ostracized ourselves well i need to ask you because i know you're a very busy man and i've took you out your workload but i'd like need to ask you can you name me your five biggest djs in the world or it could be the world but I'd like it to be the UK. UK DJs, home. what radio DJs? DJs, DJs. Ooh, God Almighty. Um, could be sound. If it's sound, love injection. All right. UK's number one sound. Musclehead, sorry, I love you, but love injection, <laughs> number one sound <laughs> in the UK right now, just because of 
where they're coming from how long they've been doing it and the fact they're still doing it now that sound there i tip my hat off of them saxon has to get a mention again musclehead i've sat with that guy and learning his history to see where he come from and the work he did to push that sound i'll give them ratings and the fact that he's got a young protege of mine on board now victor v who's a young up-and-coming dj that trained with me from trends days in the 80s if if he starts taking over that sound and the two of them work together saxon would do it if i move off of that and look at um the soul side of things rapper tap who i work with back in the day mikey them monday you can't go around them they're seriously talented not just that they actually done things professionally because if you look at the british sound system association it's mikey that's involved in all of that i used to have meetings with him for carnival and that and they're very talented and they still carry a crowd today then that's three four if i'm looking at reggae djs yeah trevor sax has been a father to me from day one um i come into the business and sax took me under his wing um in regards to advice running we used to jump in the same car and drive from regal to supertone to love dub vendor just instead of two cars every week we used to just drive in the same car so he was good like that but i also respect the way he used to present his show and and his style of things on the radio i've got to do one more one more I, i would have to give it to father keely not for his DJ talents or skills, because he's rubbish. Now I'm joking. He's good, <laughs> but it ain't for that. But I've ne- never come across anybody who's done more for music and our communities. The kids part. This guy has lost money. He's invested money. He's changed people's lives for the better. Now people talk about him in different ways, and he's not. He's he's, he's a grumpy git and not everyone's going to get on with him you have to know him yeah because me and him nearly catch up already in fight i'm not going to lie let's be real his personality we ain't gonna it's not always going to be smooth but when you see a man fear his heart then you know and i've seen keep his heart and trust me that guy dear i can't think of anybody that's done more for community or is more community minded or orientated or mm. wants to help his people well, he was the them. first one i would say that stopped that, that, that had the messages about don't take the drugs don't take the don't, don't trouble go. the guns don't mm. trouble the knives and he's been rocking that from years a long years time years. but that's my five but if you're looking for the oracle zach lwr can't go around it sit down and talk to zach if you want to know what happened in england in our community on our level from 19, how long till day? Zach, <laughs> in uh, everything, things that he, he, he'll tell you what you had for breakfast on the day you played at a dance. That's how Zach is. <laughs> okay, let me your five MCs. Late Squin Jin from Bass Oddy is the number one. He had a way of, of, of dealing with dance. Um, there's a guy called Louis Lecky, rest in peace. I heard of Louis Lecky. He's oh, another okay. one. And I can't go around Borough Banton because that's how I got my name from Borough Banton. I was going to ask you, how did you get your name? I used to be called Soldier Banton as a DJ. Right. That's when, and Borough, I took the Banton from because he used to talk non stop and that's what I used to do. Right. But when I went to go on radio, Mikey said, Boy, I mean, I want a soldier business from the radio. And I want. <laughs> so they changed it that afternoon in Mingles to Mr. Bannon somehow. Bannon. And that's what we run with because I couldn't think of nothing. Because right. I used to dress in militant green all the time. When I come from Jamaica, it's hard to. I didn't like England. I wanted to go back. So years after it, I used to dress in the militant green. Because when I was in Jamaica, I always thought I was going to end up in the army yeah. as a kid. Because I used to look at the soldier them and them big long M16. I said, boy, I can't wait to squeeze up one of them. So I said, me are going at the army. Because you got a choice. You can be yeah. a bad man or a soldier. <laughs> and I went for the you soldier. Three, no, is it two, two more MCs? Two more? Oh, wow. Two three um, yeah, MCs. two more. Because I said, um, Borough. Borough. I said, Squingy and Louis Lepke. Um, two more. Agent Sasko, he's got to get a mention because like I said, I saw him as a kid in talent and to see that and then see him make a career like he has, you you, you have to give him that. And then Beanie Man, uh, I would say Bounty because I love him, but Beanie Man, I got the 10 year old DJ Wonder album and again, for him to be on top of his game still for so long, that takes a lot. So you got to um, 
give him respect for that. But Bounty Killer though, um, that guy there, he, he is different from the rest. And I saw something in him because he told me at 18 that he was gonna rule the world. Rule the world, oh my God, rule the whole thing. I was, fat man called me and he said to me, come up at the yard, I have somebody more here to meet. So when I went up there, fat man opened the door and he called me and he said, yeah, because you know who this man is? And I look at this guy and you know when you can recognize someone's face but you never know the name? And he said, this is Mr. Light James. King Jamis to you. I was, <laughs> so he introduced me with their talking. So he said, flipping out the room, him about one of Jamis young DJ. I miss me, me hey, I play him record, Spy for Die with there. I was like, Bye, killer. Because yeah, man, him in the room with Flip. Absolutely. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, what I've got to say to you, my friend, is first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you very much for the uh, interview. It's been, it's been an eye shocker because I knew you had a bit of history and mm. you did put things to light. So what is it that Mr. Banton's going to do? Are you coming out of music altogether now or are you thinking of dipping back in? I'm not sure. The, you see with music, yeah, it's a heart. As I said, it's always been a hobby rather than a career. And it's something that I could possibly, I've got no heart for it. The reggae music industry is shot. I've built my name on playing brand new tunes. People used to sit at home, make a list, even Mr. Palmer forced me to do his top 10 back in the days for Jetstar Jet Star, yeah. because it was so popular that yeah. people was coming to his shop asking for records he didn't have so he wanted to control what I played yeah. the reggae that's being produced all that piano pling pling music <laughs> those producers need to be taken outside and slapped up because we're talking um, King Jammies, Winston Riley and, and uh, Jack Scorpio, those men laid the foundation and out of Jammies and those studios you had Bobby Dixons, you had the, the, the Tony and Dave Kelly, you had um, those producers, young producers came out and they, they, they did their thing. Mm. But the ones that are there now, the Marcuses and all of that, what, what are they producing? It's as if they're trying to get a crossover to get that big commercial hit, commercial hit and they've yeah. left reggae. Now, it might be a monetary thing, but we need somebody back in Jamaica to support reggae. And what I've noticed is that the artists, the young artists that are out there now, the tunes that they've got, because of the rhythms, they're shit. And I didn't know that, and, but listen to all the sound systems in Jamaica when they play the dub plays. The dub plates are being cut on the old rhythms. Yeah. So you're getting the young artists so with the new lyrics, so it basically. sounds good. Yeah. So yeah. it just needs. I used to go in the record shop, hear a tune, and yeah, man, want it and can't wait to get on the radio to play. Then when that died down and it was digital, you used to hear, they used to send you some folders, you'd hear it, can't wait to get on the radio. There's not been a single song in the last maybe five years that's come my way that I said I can't wait to get on the radio to play this. Well, do you know what? I can't wait to speak to you again because um, have you had any awards before? Two, The Voice gave me an award. Three, The Voice gave me an award. I got a DJ of the year in 93 and I also got uh, the young come up and coming from The Voice and one when I retired or have you had anything for your contribution towards the music? No, no. Well you have now. So, wow. Mr. Bantam, I would like to say thank you very much. On behalf of the industry street, wow. We'd like to present you with that. Can you open it up and let everybody know what does it let say? Let me see what you've got here. Chocolate. Yeah chocolates. <laughs> God, it's chocolates, Mr. Bantam. Wow, chocolate. that, that is absolutely unbelievable. What does it say, Mr. Bantam? The industry streets. Thanks, Mr. Banton. You can tell I haven't got my glasses. <laughs> Let me read it for your combat. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it says the industry street presents Mr. Banton for your contribution towards the music business. Wow. Enough respect for that, sir. That's yours. Enough respect. And I'd like to say thank you so much for taking time out and having mm. a couple of words with us at the industry street. Thank and with that, Mr. Banton, I would like to say this is all about your life. Indeed. Listen, keep on doing what you're doing because the industry street, the conversation me and you had off air regarding the work that you're doing, yeah. you're making digital history for ghetto celebrities, basically. We had a, a good innings, us, yourselves, and some are still doing Raymond's it. Raymond's doing that. But for you to be mapping that history digitally, for others to see when we're long gone, I have to commend you and give you respect for that. And thank you for that award. Unexpected, but 
Really appreciated. No More than swear. welcome. That's Mr. Banton. Absolutely an icon on the industry. I'd just like to say, watch out next week. We've got another big banger for you. So from Mr. Banton, from Peter Terry, the industry crew, we're out of here. Take care. Bye. Bless.